Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to 372 Pages. We'll never get back. I'm Mike Nelson. Connor Lestoke is here, too. Hello, Connor. What's happening, Mike? How are you? Oh, man, Connor, we have a <laughs> packed show, a packed show. Um, so much. We, of course, have our regular department's dumb sentence of the week. We have fanfic, and we have coming up a new leaked uh, Klein Ooh. Audible book. I don't think I even told you about this. This is a oh. surprise for you. <laughs> They're just uh, working on these projects in secret. I know. <laughs> There's a lot going on. The 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 Kleinaverse is is huge, and its tentacles are everywhere. And, and it's full of <laughs> dissatisfied moles passing these things along. <laughs> Apparently, leaking is not uh, is is out of control in the Kleinaverse. <laughs> um, but uh, also, we have the just the the meat of the chapters. I don't know about you, but maybe a, a record for the number of notes on on the book how about you i think so i think i think if the 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 back half of this section uh the, the last two chapters i think had more red pen uh more more just writing the word ug in the uh in, in the in the margins uh, yeah lots than, of than mother of so god uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is you know it's hard to it's it's really having done i think 14 of these that is that is pretty stunning that uh we've gotten this far and that uh this might be the most jam packed <laughs> one yes. yet and uh just to recap what we are doing is we're uh reading through the Ernest Klein book Armada you hopefully are joining us on that uh, journey and uh this is a, a follow up to having done Ready Player 1 so we're just continuing on should we dive right in or or uh yeah well i mean i just uh we, we, we it's important that uh we acknowledge that uh, it's the first of March today as we record this, mm-hmm. and I went to uh, I went to see Black Panther last night at the theater, and there were uh, a lot of posters up for the movie, which is coming out in uh, I guess four weeks from when we release this today. Oh wow! So uh, it's a uh, going to be a big moment. March is coming in like a lamb and going out like a Klein and <laughs> oh, good God! <laughs> and I just. I was looking at the posters and I was like, uh, it's just a damn shame that it had to come out this month because, uh, you know, March has real, no real good puns on it, but there's a chance, there's a small chance that if it had come out, you know, towards the end of the year, Mm -hmm. like they, the marketing team could have deemed it like, you know, this year, October is (laughs) Guntober. And when the world is deprived that by it coming out in a single syllable month with no room for puns in it. But to me, March 2018 is hereafter going to be Guntober. <laughs> that yeah, Gunter is a tough word to work into into anything. <laughs> it's got that sort of sexy roll off the tongue feel, you know. Oh, you can yeah. imagine uh, sort of Jennifer Lawrence whispering it in your ear. Yeah, yeah right. It's a uh, it's sort of the French romance language. You can uh, <laughs> Happy Le Pew, uh, my little Gunter. <laughs> Or just imagine Hitler shrieking it from a thing. Like, <laughs> ah, that's pretty, uh, pretty much the same thing. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's get into it. We were assigned. Well, let's uh, the the recap, uh, which we can do pretty pretty succinctly now, is that uh, some kid uh, plays video games and uh, aliens are attacking, and so he's sort of whisked away by the secret alien fighting squad that the world has been putting together for years uh, to to fight the aliens because he's good at video games. Have I got there that you go. pretty much right? 165 pages, yeah, yes. plus a uh, insanely hot mom. But that is uh, where we're at at this point in time. The the last one ended with him you know, sailing out, his, well, his drone sailing out. He's sitting inside a big arcade cabinet, but his drone is soaring out to go uh, take on these glaive fighters because the uh, invasion of Earth by the Europeans has started. Uh, you you pronounced glaive fighters wrong. Could you re, <laughs> Sorry. redo that? Sorry, he's going out to to to, to uh, tackle the glaive and fighters. There we go. Thank you. I believe um, that's standard pronunciation. Right. But uh, yeah, so he uh, he starts this off. This was uh, this one took me back. It was a, a, a delightful uh, turn of phrase that you only get from your Ernest Kleins. But he he introduces the uh, what's about to go down as the Battle of Crystal Palace, as it came to be known. <laughs> And uh, you'll uh, you'll you'll appreciate this because if that sounds familiar, it's because <laughs> he used the exact same uh, device back in uh, RP one when uh, it was towards the end of it. But he says the big Gunter clans had once again banded together to launch a coordinated attack on the Sixers forces. It was the beginning of what would come to be known as the Battle of Frobaz. 
Yeah, this uh, what what is what came to be known as thing. <laughs> uh, I have the note here. That was my first note too, and it said, uh, <laughs> "All right, it's one clause in, and I'm already irritated." <laughs> so yeah, that happened quickly for me. What what do you mean? Yeah. As it came to be known. Yeah, is Shelby Foote supposed to be narrating this like as a uh, in a Ken Burns documentary? Right. Like it's your <laughs> there is no history going on uh, here. Uh, it's just yeah, yeah you are narrating moment by moment. Um <laughs> which uh, there more of that later because there's some fantastic uh, examples of of the narrator getting confused about whether or not he's the narrator. Yeah, uh, yeah, that the, was a, so last last um, week we had him constantly having these out of body experiences, which there's like one or two of them this time around. But this time it was de- the uh, the theme was definitely the narrator um, being <laughs> uncertain of what he was either seeing or describing to us. Yeah. Which was very frustrating at times. <laughs> you're, we're we're, we're counting on you. You're you're our only you're our only way into this universe. Please <laughs> be more reliable. Right, and it's not you know again. If, if it was a smarter book, that would you'd be like, oh, is he employing the classic unreliable narrator device here? Are we you know being subject to the uh, machinations of a guy who we can't entirely trust? But like it's it's just a repeated device that he just doesn't understand. Yeah. Please, when you try to make it too complicated, you're really pulling a pendergast there. Come on, come on. <laughs> um, so we get right into it, and he he immediately goes to what has he has foreshadowed has been an inspiration for the entire book, and that is a movie called Flight of the Navigator. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I've I questioned you beforehand, but let's repeat this conversation. Do you you know this movie? I I do not know it at all. I've never seen it. I've never met anyone that's seen it. I've never <laughs> talked to anyone. It's never come up in conversation. I've never seen it on anyone's shelf in either DVD or VHS form or laserdisc for that matter. Uh, so I'm I'm completely out of the loop. What what is your knowledge of this? So my impression of it, it probably, I'm, I think it might have been like a, a live action Disney um, movie, but uh, I think it must have aired on TV, like, you know, on the Sunday night, like Disney movie type of thing, because it was always something people had like a VHS tape of. It wasn't like the official one, but it was like recorded off a of TV. I, I think a teacher in middle school put it on towards the like last day of school. And it was always one of those movies that never made me feel entirely comfortable because it had this kid like getting poked and prodded, I think, in like a facility. And like he, he came back and like everyone had aged 20 years and they didn't recognize him. So it, it, I never enjoyed it. There was some some weird little stop motion creatures. And Pee Wee Herman was someone that from a young age I always found kind of interesting. I didn't see Pee Wee's Big Adventure until uh, <laughs> you and Sean talked about it for endlessly to the point where I was like, I'm watching the movie just so I can. Hey, this is a big gap in your knowledge. And we were just there to, to, um, to guide you into his wonderful world. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, he's a voice in it. I guess. Is, is what? Uh, Paul Rubens is a voice in it because that comes yeah, up the later of the, of the thing. But yeah, it was something that people had seen, I think, um, at a certain age, but nothing, you know, people weren't putting posters up of it in their dorm room or anything like that. This is not, um, you know, the Princess Bride or something, something that kind of keeps no. bubbling to the surface and is shown to yeah. children or anything like that. I don't right? think so. They're not doing a 25th anniversary uh, Fathom events uh, in theaters nationwide for Flight of the Navigator. Right. Well, that's what sort of, I don't know, I, I'm just going to say puzzled, but I, I just might as well be honest. That irritates me that he uses <laughs> this movie, which seems fairly inconsequential, is just the linchpin of the whole it's damn endeavor. <laughs> And, uh, and so that, that made me curious and, uh, I did a little investigation and it turns out that, uh, Ernest Klein, he didn't just write these books. He, because of the popularity of, of, uh, these books that he did though, he was able to secure a job, um, when, when they were going to do a special edition of, um, uh, to kill a mockingbird, Whoa. they approached Ernest Klein and asked him, could he just sort of, you know, do a little rewrite to make it more friendly <laughs> to the uh, to the audible crowd, and so uh, wow. I discovered his version I'd of it. That, heard that Harper e. Lee was kind of like ailing, and they were not certain whether like someone else had gotten control of her estate. You know, that was how Go right. Tell a Watchman sort of came out. It was uh... exactly so. It's he he <laughs> wow. uh, he sort of expurgated it uh, and uh, and rewrote it just a little to clean it up for. Audible, and I happen to uh, I have a sample of that. So uh, wow, let's yeah, let's let, let's take a listen. All right, here we go.
Atticus said to Jem one day, I'd rather you shoot tin cans in the backyard, but I, I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them. But remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. It's like that movie, We're in the Army Now, with Paulie Shore, Andy Dick, and David Allen Greer. No, it was a sin for Pauly Shore to pledge to protect his country, but then go about with all his shenanigans. Do you understand, Jim? I... I don't think so, Pa, said Jim. Right now I feel confused, like Leslie Nielsen and Mr. Magoo are Scott Bayo and Super Baby's Baby Geniuses, too. Atticus smiled and patted Jem's arm. It's natural to feel confused, son. Just as Christina Applegate was confused in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Now, do you understand? I, uh, I think so, said Jem, cocking his head to one side. What you're saying is, I'm like... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Use. But when I'm older, I'll be more like Cool as Ice with Vanilla Ice. <laughs> no, now you've got it, son. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's, that is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's what it was missing. Yeah. I mean, everything, uh, every bit of literature could be made better by <laughs> reference to a completely forgettable movie from the 80s slash 90s, I think. Right. And Klein has proven that. So, yeah. Uh, the Boy Who Could Fly. There might have been a reference to that, that the scene where uh, Fred Savage shoot, shoots a super soaker full of pee <laughs> at the bad guys. That was an oversight on his part, I think. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we're we're just lucky to keep getting this stuff, and I I thank yeah. the, I thank the leakers for that. That's nice. I yeah, it's 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 brave of them, I guess, because we're really just sort of being blatant about it. Um, so um, just stay strong, guys, and then keep it coming. <laughs> That's right. Um, All right. So diving into chapter twelve. Well, yeah. So after that flight of the navigator thing, he's uh he's he, you know whimsically said that to Pee Wee Herman, but he's sort of finds it distracting once he's in a real battle. So he says that he switched uh, the voice back to the default female, which fun fact had been recorded by the actress Candace Bergen. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the, the word fun uh, as defined as uh, enjoyment, amusement or lighthearted pleasure had a great run. Um, but I think that's got to be the uh, the nail in the coffin for it because that's possibly the least fun fact I've ever heard. It's also such a uh, such a weird thing to do in the middle of a of a book. Just I don't know, fun fact. <laughs> I've never seen a novel that has done that uh, kind of right. thing. I suppose in the hands of a talented person that could be a playful, weird little. Uh, uh, aside or something, but uh, right, but not, in the hands of a not, guy who's not. flying into battle, and and it must be a reference to something, you know, like because otherwise it it would be hilarious if that was just the person he picked. Like I, you know, I hope that she's doing okay, but you don't hear much about her these days. But right. um, she must have uh, voiced, you know, a, a talking car in some awful show or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> now here here was a so he gets in his. Uh, He's in his pod, right? He's he's running his things, and he mm -hmm. says, here was a sentence that jumped out to me. To my surprise, I managed to take out seven enemy ships in rapid succession with precise sustained bursts from laser turret, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Wait, you were trying to do this. Why, why would it surprise you? You've done it many, many times before in the, uh, in the game itself. But, whoa, right. look at this. Look what I'm doing. Again, it's his out-of-body... Holy cow, I surprised myself when I did something right. I've done hundreds of times before. I bet a bunch of the uh, the uh, Winter Olympians the past couple of weeks were, were surprised as they pulled off the uh, yeah. the uh, ski jumps that they've been training their entire life to be right. able to do on a world-class scale. And then here's a sentence that uh, I just want... I wish, I wish we had access to uh, to the voiceover talent that you know people like Audible and uh, and all of those movies that we've leaked on this program do. But uh, this is a sentence that needs to be done by like Liam Neeson and uh, Patrick right. Stewart. I closed one eye, took a breath, held it, and then fired and fired again and again, and then all caps. Boom! Kaboom! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I just want multiple readings of that from every right. voiceover guy. Ryan Blessed, Samuel yeah. L. <laughs> yes. Matt John Smith. John Riss Davies. Everyone. Um, well, yeah, his surprise sort of, as we said, is the uh, is, is a is a seemingly uh, thematic element in this next uh, couple of chapters. But he's he has this sort of weird sense that something is amiss throughout this entire thing. And, uh, you know, so this is it's clearly foreshadowing something um, that is going to be a, a twist, I'm guessing, at the end of this book, because he's been he's been laying it on so thick that it would be, uh, you know, it wouldn't be surprising if it was all for naught, but it has to be right. I mean, I guess, but it's it's so the way it's done is so clumsy that I can't you can't tell. I mean, again, it's like with his um, joking or or accidental humor. It, it's impossible to tell. They're both the same. You know, they say the words beyond parody and he <laughs> even in his own book is beyond his own parody. Like you can never tell. Uh, I mean, so I don't know. He, I suppose so. I mean, uh, yeah, because he's he's sort of saying he says stuff about the enemy fighters where he's. He's surprised that uh, they're sort of behaving the same way they are in the video game. He's like, why would the same tactics work now in the real world? Oh, oh that part to- of it. Yeah, that for sure is some uh, that's some, some reveal. Yeah, 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 yeah. How could Chaos Terrain have been able to simulate the enemy's maneuvers and tactics with such a high level of precision and accuracy? That shouldn't be possible. But it's this he's done. He did this when he arrived too, where he's you know, he learned that this situation <laughs> existed two hours ago. And yet he's already like nitpicking it. It would be like, you know, going into uh to uh astrophysics 101 and like raising your hand to einstein being like excuse me sir i uh i'm not sure about this whole uh emc squared thing you're presenting me i like right. <laughs> i've opened my textbook to page two and yet i already have a lot of questions yeah and his <clears throat> throughout the whole thing his observations of things are I, I mean in a word kind of schizophrenic he his emotions bounce around. And again, I don't think this is part of his, you know, built up unstable personality or anything. I think this is just him accidental or maybe one day he was writing and, you know, he felt this way and then he closed his computer. And when he opened it up the next day, he felt a different way. So right, he, yeah. But things surprise him, enrage him, <laughs> make him laugh all within the space of less than a minute. I mean, the turnaround Go. is shocking. Yeah, and it's not his uh, built-up anger management thing because it happens. We'll see when he meets like the other characters in the top ten. Like they're all having these like wild swings of like right. you know a chill ran down his spine and I detected genuine fear. And then the next sentence he's like cracking wise about someone being like, "Well, I didn't know that God invented aliens." Like so, it's there's right. no consistency with any of this thing. It probably is just like you know whipping the laptop open at the coffee shop and not even reading what you had written the previous day. It's a good point, right? Um, but the, uh, but one thing that he is consistent on is the uh, the unceasing uh, torrent of of Star Wars references, which I just I noted that there was um, as he's fighting. You know, I heard the words of a young Luke Skywalker echo in my mind. It'll be just like Beggars Canyon back home. And then uh, one one paragraph in between, he says that sober Kai fighters had always suffered from stormtrooper syndrome, and I could just imagine that the editor, in the theoretical editor, being like, "You gotta cut one of these, man. Like you can't just." Have them back to back like that because that's it's terrible that you it can't be the whole frame of reference and him just being like nope leave it in instead <laughs> instead all of this yeah there's uh there's one coming up that uh, that takes the cake but I think that's in chapter uh, fifteen or whatever um I, but yeah sure he, he, yeah he lays it on uh, but it's not only Star Wars references here was one that um, you know if he were there next to me i would punch him in the face i, I would feel bad about it immediately I, it goes against my values and all of that but he said i reoriented my tactical display to a two dimensional view and it instantly reminded me of the classic arcade game missile command <laughs> yeah did we have that as a fan fiction one one time like as a as a test i it, it stood out to me but yeah that was uh it instantly things always are, are instantly uh, that's another thing that i noticed is I, I'm not sure he knows how adverbs and things work. Like everything has to happen instantly. They have to happen a million or a zillion times. There, there's he lays it on so thick in a way that's like, why does it have to happen instantly? <laughs> it reminded <laughs> and, uh, me of you know we know how you tick boxes. Just go ahead and tick the box. It doesn't have to be instant. And missile command is a uh, it's the video game equivalent of you know when you give a four year old um, a crayon and say you know draw. Um, 
your house with your family outside of it. And like everyone's this, you know, pretty much like half the size of the house. There's birds that look like M's. You know, if you draw mountains, they're like just, you know, uh, upside down dirt, uh, upside down W's. So like the missile command is, is line drawings like that. So it's a, uh, the idea of missile command is a vivid mental image, but it's the least like vivid image you could use to describe this act of flying into war. Right. Exactly. Um, you mentioned the the uh, fictional editor that we're calling on the carpet. Yes, right. um, I recommend that we build a gallows for this next thing. This is uh, and uh, and hang him high. Um, I think I, I peeked a little at your notes. I admit, I think I sent you a little message that I just uh-huh. wanted to make sure that we weren't, you know, doing confusing each other. I just wanted to make that sure I was you... just listing praise for everything yeah that you had (laughs) something had happened to you (laughs) this is this is really going great i'm excited hit on the head with a flower pot from the fifth story and now all of a sudden i think these books are good right uh here's the uh, here's the line um the giant some sort of their enemy assembles into a a a giant he forms like voltron Voltron. and the happened to be the head I know. I didn't even. I went. I was too depressed to type. <laughs> uh, the giant junkyard golem began to bound across the solitary paved road leading up to the isolated farmhouse facade, uprooting the line of utility poles adjacent to it, until the power line snapped across its chest like Godzilla. Yep. The power lines snapped across its chest like Godzilla. Yep. Is uh, not an actual simile. <laughs> Godzilla is a power line who snaps across things chests apparently yeah, yeah. but this is, is where a, uh, come on editor just what why did you give up i mean you can't <laughs> that can't be allowed to stand that cannot yes it snapped through the power lines like godzilla like right that's i mean that, that's the fix yes yes <laughs> this is not difficult yeah. so i think the teacher who showed us flight of the navigator was mrs weldon seventh grade um english uh, and that was the class where we, you like on the blackboard or whiteboard, learn to diagram sentences. Like we spent sure, you know, yeah. a month doing that when I don't remember how any of those work, but that's, you would identify the subject and then the modifiers and all that. And that's this, this is that exercise where she would be like, how do you fix this? Cause that, yeah, that stood out to me immediately is just being like, this is in a, is a, in a book that sold hundreds of thousands of copies and it's just, you know, yeah. Seventh grade English. Yeah, editor, I am calling you out. You you failed. What? Where was your courage? Where? What happened to you? You uh, were you hitting the bottle? What did he? You know, was there some trauma in his life or something? What? His or her life? Um, I need to know. This is inexcusable. This should have been a note on the side, like with profanity and just like no, 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 rewrite. It should have been a phone call, like stop this, stop it. But uh, that was allowed to stand. Maybe the uh, the editor's pencil had uh, snapped like King Kong, <laughs> and so they were unable to <laughs> make a note in the uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's hard to come up with. I can't even really like recreate that because it's so foreign to the way that language works. There's uh, I we've talked about this before. The uh, um, Eric uh, what's his name uh, at cinema on the cinema or whatever. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> He Eric he has Wareheim. Eric Wareheim. He has a talent for doing that mangled sentences, and one that always made me laugh at at the intro of his little show about movies. He says, "When you've got movies like Tom Cruise in them, you know you're doing good." <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a weirdly perfect mangled thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what this to, kind of remind me of. Hard to recreate, especially on the fly. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so yeah, power lines are snapping like Godzilla, and uh, but Lex is still here, and she's uh, she's power leaping. Until she's not. Uh, she power leaps towards the newly assembled glaive mechs. And, uh, but then uh, just two paragraphs later, she power jumps her sentinel uh, before the other sentinels unload on it. And I just uh, – I'm not on board with the power jump. I'm a power leaper. Um, well, I had a note. I don't know what either thing is. <laughs> right, exactly. That's what I think is funny. I assume – I mean I, it, it, the, the existence of power leaping implies a sub-level of leaping that's just normal um, – uh, but we haven't seen that yet, so I'm I'm imagining these are both just jumps, um, like you do in any uh, in any given Halo 
uh, type of game. Right, right. But why not the four-paragraph description in dry, dreadfully boring language about what it is? I, I just I felt left out for the first right. time from these <laughs> descriptions of how to play video games. Uh, right, yeah, but, but you, you, you want more descriptions of this? Because this is a, it's an entire <laughs> chapter of a video game. Uh, which, I'm saying it's but, an odd omission on his part to not sure, have a yes. uh, four paragraphs on it. It reminds. So you have not read Infinite Jest, right? I mean, I know that, but um, I believe it, it might be on a shelf somewhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I have well, not read but, it. But you are probably aware of the, one of the things people talk about is that it is as lengthy uh, descriptions of tennis playing. Oh yeah, I've read That's I've read like, other things where he goes deep into tennis, and I'm exactly. I'm a an avid tennis player and fan. Exactly. And, yes. and I was glazing over. <laughs> <laughs> so he, I mean, you know, it, it's it's possibly overstated, but they are they are lengthy, but it's. Uh, this is sort of what I was uh, was I was thinking about this sort of self indulgent. Um, I like this, and these are the the things you appreciate when you're in deep with it. Um, but at least those were contained within a a novel that was full of other rich characters and the human condition and and actual humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And John Irving a, does it with uh, with wrestling, I believe, <laughs> but he ah. he doesn't lay it on too thick, and it's <laughs> it's sort of humorous the way he does it. Um, here's another video game term. I just didn't know it. I jinked my ship down and to the left. Is that uh, a, is that a thing? I mean, I know I it's a word. I just have never, it must be a video game, uh, I, you know, common or something. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, jinked. Uh, it just irritated me when I saw it. It's a reference of, uh, is it Daphne on Scooby-Doo that says jinkies? I don't know. I'm yeah, not sure. It yeah. is not something that's Wait, you mean the classic the... TV show? <laughs> right. Uh, what else? He, uh, oh yeah, he's, uh, he's reminded of playing Space Invaders, uh, classic, um, where this is another example of him being uncertain. He says, the last alien alive was always the bitch of the bunch and the hardest to kill because it moved faster than all the others. Was it my imagination or did this, or did this glaive suddenly seem a whole lot harder to kill than all its cannon father, fodder brethren? And again, we don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> we're not there. Yeah. This didn't actually happen. You're, you're relating it all to us, uh, plus so. the uh, the bitch and its brethren too. So that's that's a good one. <laughs> right. Um, Here, there was a nice little poetic thing. He uh, he continued to pursue it as it rocketed downward, closing in on the row of launch silos jutting up from the charred and blackened earth like a row of skeletal fingers. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's I, a. Uh, I miss that. Yeah, that's that's Klein sort of. Pulling out his, uh, his 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 poetry one hundred and one chops of uh, metaphor and simile. Uh, sentence for me. Luckily, I happen to be here to save the day. <laughs> Terrible sentence. Um, <laughs> and then I got a beef with this one. They glanced, but they glanced off its shields, and it kept right on trucking. <laughs> Keep on trucking. That's a current thing, right? People people say that a lot. They right, wear, they wear was, the t shirt with the with the big shoe guy, and they yeah, the thumb that was up before his the... father would have uh, <laughs> would have even been alive to experience that. But hmm, he was was possibly it was like the doodah man. Yes, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you've got anything else. But he follows the the ship. He disobeys um, General Vance's orders. He follows his ship down uh, into the thing. He notes that. Uh, Unlike the uh, the video game where uh, like officer compliance would be reward you points, which is a fun little f- fun little bonus. That's what people are always looking for in their video games is to be rewarded for compliance. Compliance, but, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, he follows it down and causes this whole sort of uh, mishap because the thing explodes and it wouldn't have happened if he had let it just go down there type of thing. But uh, the chapter uh, ends with Lex uh, approaching him and uh, – She softly sings, you're in trouble. And you know the whole thing is serious because she's she's not snort laughing at the situation. She's not like biting her lower lip coyly and uh, snickering. So we're really he's in for it. Oh, but there's uh, some stuff coming up that uh, she does that is (laughs) quite amazing. Uh, This is my last note on 12 is that uh, this sentence I nodded and got to my feet unsteadily. Uh, then I stepped out of the, my control pod, feeling almost as if I had just emerged from a real interceptor and a real battle, which, of course, I had. <laughs> so all of the almost as if was was wasting your time and ours. Why, yes. <laughs> oh. why describe what happened and then it's almost as if. It's almost <laughs> as if I went and made a sandwich, which, of course, I did. 
I guess. <laughs> Just I mean, I guess it. it's him doing the weird thing where it's not. He's sort of is piloting the drone, but oh, I man. know, I know, but uh, yeah, we know what's yeah. happening. It's like we don't need it explained <laughs> again. Well, let's take a break uh, from the actual uh, bad Klein writing to see what people have uh, if they've been able to imitate bad Klein writing in uh, fan. F- oh yes, fan favorite, fan fiction or real. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been delightful to watch the uh, the sort of evolution of these. It's sort of like a machine learning uh, how to play chess or something like. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, early on, people were like, "Oh, I'm just going to throw in a bunch of references." That's that's funny, but people have adapted uh, to some of the new techniques he's been using. Um, yeah, so yeah, kudos again, people. You've you've got some really good fan fiction here. Yes. Um, uh, so, and you are challenging me today. We are. Yes. We're going to keep it a little briefer and. Uh, and I am on the uh, I'm on the block here. So uh, yes. test so me I've out. Got, I've got four for you. Uh, number one, Cruz caught a glimpse of my QCOM screen, which was now divided into over half a dozen windows, each with a different person's face, just like the opening of the Brady Bunch. So he decided <laughs> to so he decided to belt out an impromptu parody of the opening line of the show's theme song. This is the story of an alien invasion by some fuckheads <laughs> from Europa who are. That was all he managed to get out before Dial snapped his laptop shut, cutting him off. He winced at me apologetically. It's okay, I told him. The council has me on hold. Dial exhaled and re- reopened his laptop. Cruz was still singing away. All of them has tentacles like their mother, the youngest one in curls. Dial laughed. Cruz laughed. I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, again, this is too crafty because... Uh, <laughs> If I hadn't read what's coming up, the next few chapters, I would have immediately come to the conclusion that, you know, very funny, but obviously fan fiction. But I'm, I'm going to, why don't you go on to the next sample and I'll ponder. All right. The enemy base lay before us on the planet surface, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was laid out almost exactly the same as the enemy base in Bilya from the movie Iron Eagle. Iron Eagle was one of my all-time favorite movies. I had the entire film memorized. So this was like a giant neon <laughs> Eat at Joe's sign from the universe. I knew exactly where to strike to destroy the entire thing. Then, when some enemy ships barreled toward me like angry bulls that had just destroyed a china shop and then saw me walking by, the universe decided to straight up kick me in the pants. The mixtape I was listening to, the same one I always listen to on my missions, started playing Queen's One Vision, the very same song that Doug plays in his fighter plane while assaulting the base in Iron Eagle. This was my moment to show these alien scum who they were really dealing with. Oh my gosh! <laughs> All right, I think I'm I'm formulating my answer now. So uh, continue. Right. Two more. I popped down into the cockpit of the down glaive fighter. Looking at the console, I realized Armada had never given me the opportunity to actually play as the enemy. It made sense. We were being trained to fight the Europeans, not join them. Staring blankly at the alien controls, I wished I had a real life game genie right about now. The Game Genie was a pass-through device that in the early 90s allowed gamers to hack the original Nintendo Entertainment System, as well as the Sega Genesis, Super NES, Game Boy, and even the long-forgotten Game Gear. All I would have to do was jam it in, enter a code, and I'd be flying this thing with unlimited lives. Deciding the best method would be just to throw caution to the wind, I punched punched a blinking red button on the console shaped like a swastika and pulled back on the control lever. I was flattened into the seat as the Glaive Fighter accelerated into the atmosphere. Now this is pod racing, I heard myself exclaim. Oh boy, wow. <laughs> well, each one is making it tougher as it goes on. All right, one more. All right, and here's the last one. Alien fighters full of holes, wounded, and corpses took off backwards from motherships. They flew over Earth cities that were in flames. The fighters exerted a miraculous magnetism that shrunk the fires, gathered them into beams of energy, and sucked them back into their ships. Earth drones flew up, sucked bullets and shrapnel from the aliens and their fighters. It reminded me of a scene from my favorite book of all time, the novelization of Richard Donner's Superman the movie. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. Those are all of them, right? Those are all. So we've got uh, the guy singing the Brady Bunch theme song. We have uh, Iron Eagle and Queen. We have uh, Game Genie. And then we have uh, Richard Donner's Superman the movie novelization. All right, so the rule is they could all be fan fiction, they could all be real, mm-hmm. um, but let's guess. There's, there's going to be fan fiction in there. I, <laughs> I'm going to say uh, that one, uh, three, and four are fanfic, and that two, God help me, is real. <laughs> the Iron Eagle one? The Iron Eagle. 
No, you were wrong. <laughs> oh, uh, no. which, number... which is the, is there a real one? Brady Bunch is number one. No, He's real. get the, f- <laughs> no, it's the story of an alien invasion. That's so the, impossible. Uh... That's impossible. <laughs> So uh the uh the the guys who are born in tw- 1999 I guess are familiar with the Brady Bunch theme song. The oh, uh man. Brady Bunch movie probably came out 3 years before they were born, but they are uh that's the <laughs> holy <laughs> that a- smokes. I I yep. thought uh, you know, again, we do it all the time. Dial it back, fanfic writer. This is no way. <laughs> the uh, the uh, Iron Eagle one was written by Jeremy. It's uh, that was very good. The uh, the giant neon Eat at Joe's sign from the universe, I thought, was uh, <laughs> uh, kind of touched that to was it. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, Brett wrote the uh, Game Genie one, which. Again, like there was just, I think maybe listing Sega Genesis, Super NES, Game Boy, and, and Game Gear was the, that was just going a little bit uh, too close to the sun. What? Well, not after that Brady Bunch thing? <laughs> when, when he goes back into the verses, I was like, all yeah, right, yeah. He, come he's on. still singing, and then it ends with everybody laughing, which is a, uh, <laughs> and then the uh, the other one uh, was, the last one was Dustin, which I told him, I, uh, I don't think this is going to trick Mike, but the favorite book of all time being the novelization of Richard Donner's <laughs> Superman. The movie was a line that made me laugh. So I put yes. it in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. All right. Well done. I think that's, that's uh, we've had like three in a row of people getting tricked. Yeah, that is incredible. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, onward to chapter yep. 13. Yeah. Um, um, I, I started out with this observation. The, uh, here's a sentence. The dreamlike euphoria I'd felt during my arrival here had now completely subsided replaced with a cocktail of confusion, uncertainty, and most of all, doom. And I just wrote, you know, I've, I've held back. I've tried to be reasonable. This guy is a terrible, <laughs> terrible writer. I mean, I'll finish the book, but God in heaven, that's an awful sentence. Read it one more time. The dreamlike euphoria I'd felt during my arrival here had now completely subsided, replaced with a cocktail of confusion, uncertainty, and most of all, doom. <laughs> I mean, you know, the two chapters ago, the guy was saying that he'd never even had a drink before. So that's an interesting uh, a m- metaphor to use as a cocktail of all those things. Well, in the in the middle of talking about the euphoria subsiding and then a cocktail of conf- it's just him trying. He, he's getting above his station again. Just <laughs> stay to stay uh, in your video game lane there, uh, writer. But well, he's uh, he's he's going he's going to devolve very quickly back to that because he's about to uh, essentially launch into the classic angry chief uh, trope. Oh, man. Yeah, the, the, the scene that he so that this is an odd thing I, I noted that he uh, he loves Top Gun seems like a, uh-huh. seems like it's a little off of his uh, the beaten path. But I guess Iron Eagle is maybe that was his uh, his drug into the Top Gun world or something. Yeah, I mean, I think Top Gun just must have been a really you know popular movie. I, Top Gun was still people people liked to you know get get hammered and watch that while I was in college. So yeah, but um, I just mean that it's not a uh, genre picture in the same sense that's true. that he. I mean, everything that he likes is a genre picture. His mom likes more mainstream stuff like back to back viewings of say anything, <laughs> but uh, he's yeah, he's pretty I, much in genre films and and video games. Yeah, I guess it probably is just if you were in the 80s, that was probably something that was, uh, you know, it's probably his roadhouse. Maybe it doesn't make a it doesn't make much sense. How does he not bring up roadhouse in these movies? I don't know. In these books. Yeah. But so the reason he's called on the carpet is he is ordered to stand down um, instead of chasing some ship. My eyes were glazing over about the action, but somehow it was a a move that he shouldn't have done. And that's why she sing song that you're in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) And. So then he's called into the uh, the room. Just picture the scene in Top Gun where the sweaty right. the sweaty guy down in the room and the two guys standing at terrified attention. Yes, and uh, that's what happens. And so the uh, the angry chief says, "Bravo, Iron Eagle." The admiral said, giving me two sarcastic thumbs up. <laughs> admirals known for their playful sarcasm (laughs) after someone destroys what like a million of their drones or something like that drones that had taken millions of dollars i think it was over 500 i mean the the exact (laughs) thing was you know he says how many and then he goes that was a lot (laughs) um but yeah it's a uh, so by the time i first learned of the angry chief trope it was 
being referenced by other things because it was such a cliche, like in high school. Like the, the first, you, you probably, you know, watched shows that, that, you know, laid the ground for that. Yeah, yeah. I remember I told you the uh, there was a... <laughs> There was a, a 70s, maybe late 70s uh, TV movie show called McLeod with an actor okay. named Dennis Weaver, who was a cowboy in New York City. Yeah, I've seen the and, intro. And he would get in trouble. And the chief was like rumpled tie, you know, like pulled down in a vest, di- disheveled. And <laughs> it would always be, you know, you you got 15 squad cars cracked up and you angered the, you know, the the head of the committee and all of this. And good job, McLeod. That's how it always ended. But <laughs> right. uh, yeah, that so, trope was already quite old when it was on yeah. TV in the 70s. I saw it on The Simpsons and I saw it on uh, The Beastie Boys made a sabotage video that was a parody of that. And uh, then the, the my favorite one was a, a comic called Snake and Bacon. And I just the dialogue is so similar to what goes on here that I had to pull it. It was a, the chief yelling at this snake and a piece of bacon. He had, damn it, snake and bacon. You caught the criminals, but you also blew up half the damn harbor. I ought to throw you both off the force, but instead I'm giving you both promotions. Now get out. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. It's well, well trod turf at this point in time. Does now he had referenced the? I think the line in Top Gun is something about like, you know, by the time I bust you down, you'll be shipping rubber dog shit off to Taiwan yeah. or something like that. Is that actually in here, or did he reference that before? I think? yes, we read that as a as a potential fan fiction because um, oh, okay. he then says, "Oh, I recognize that. That was from Top Gun," and that's when he uh, he goes on to uh, he realizes. Um, I suddenly realized who I was talking to. Admiral Vance was also Viper. So that's um, there. And then one sentence later, until now, I hadn't known that Viper and Admiral Vance were the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. But uh, so, yeah, the uh, Admiral Vance is uh, is this angry guy. The, he's been working his entire life. He's like left behind his wife um, to come and work here. But he's also spending time as one of the top fighters, um, customizing his virtual drone with multicolored designs as a member of the top five flying circus, um, wow. which I found entertaining as the, uh, you know, if you're going to see this fiction through to it's uh, what we're supposed to interpret it, like this hardened guy is going into the uh, character customizer, like in The Sims, and just sort of right. <laughs> deciding what design he wants on his. Um, uh, but he reveals, our angry chief reveals, and I thought this was the the dumbest reveal <laughs> It reveals that his father is alive in kind of this really dry way. The EDA faked your father's death when he was first recruited. All our early recruits were forced to cut off all contact with their old lives. So just sort of a dry reading of, yeah, your dad's still alive. Instead of him flying in a battle with some unknown guy, like, oh, I did, that's his handle. I rec- recognize his handle. And then they mm-hmm. defeat some force together and they get out and yeah. my jaw dropped. There it was is. my father, you know, end of a chapter. What the hell is this reveal? <laughs> this is, I thought it's so stupid. Like even for Klein, he, <laughs> he knows how to use that cliche, right? But apparently not. Right. Uh, it's more of a, uh, a, a paperwork kind of thing. It's like if, uh, Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams, you know, instead of seeing his dad sort of in the background coming out of the cornfield, like there had been a, uh, a emotion at the city council meeting when they were banning Catcher in the Rye to like, you know, right. well, you know by the way, uh, Ray, <laughs> your, your father is. Uh... <laughs> yeah, um, that's but... just it seemed like such an unforced error. It's just not that difficult to do. But um, well, yeah, but that would, you know, that actual drama, not not necessarily something that he's. uh capable of doing i guess like it does have a lot of hang time between that reveal and then him uh his emotions fluctuating wildly before, as they travel to the moon to actually meet his father yeah but he uh but then his this uh the angry chief the the admiral here he uh he bags on zach's father right away i thought this was really funny what he did says, he say trust me zach your father never forgot about you he was actually kind of a crybaby over how much he missed you to be honest <laughs> 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 hey man i mean i just found out he's alive right yeah he's kind of a piece of shit i mean yeah you know, it's very he's like strange the, uh he's come he's the guy who comes to your at your house and tells you stories about your dad's college days kind of thing but he's <laughs> doing that right off the bat as soon as the right. kid realizes uh my favorite metaphor uh was the uh when he's this reveal happens he just he 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 doesn't really uh elaborate at all but he just says the words fell on me like an avalanche and which yes. I thought was kind of funny. Like, that's, 
All right. Sure. <laughs> well done. Uh, but uh, the something that I thought was 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 funny and it turns out to be very interesting uh, is he he employs a similar device that the uh, character in Ready Player One did when he meets with the bad guy of essentially doing uh, like cocky, like putting my feet up on the desk kind of thing. Like uh, the the angry chief is showing him uh, the footage of him screwing up and getting all these things destroyed. And Zach goes, uh, hey, you skipped right over all that footage of me kicking ass. I protested. Can't we watch a little of that, you know, for context? So it's that awful sort of smarmy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so this is fascinating. I will uh, I will admit that in order to make this easier to uh, take notes on and, uh, you know, search for things, I downloaded a uh, on a a copy of this ebook. Uh, from a, you know, a Googled Armada Moby. Um, mm. And so, you know, I'm, I'll just put that out there. Mm. But I noticed when I when I opened it up this time, it says this is an uncorrected ebook. And this is not a bit. I'm not going to launch into a fake leak scene or anything. It says this is an uncorrected ebook. Please do not quote for publication until you check your copy against the finished book. And that part is not in this um, initial Moby, like the review copy. Oh, really? So like someone was like, take this out. Uh, and then he like, again, steaded it and put it back in for the actual <laughs> copy that we're holding in our hands, which is fascinating. I, you know, <laughs> right. who knows what happened or, or what the uh, what the uh, the thought process was there. But the, I mean, it's obviously a terrible scene um, and it is not needed or anything. But uh, there was a little back and forth, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, if they're uh, if they're still using the old paper method, uh, and then he has a stamp with stead on it. He, he <laughs> yes. you know, he's got one of those drinking birds that just uh, <laughs> stamps it onto the uh, thing over and over. Uh, you said something though that uh, Im- implied that there were fake leaked scenes, or you were doing bits or something. I didn't, I didn't understand <laughs> that, but I'll let, let it pass. Let it pass. <laughs> um, uh, so after the words are falling on him like an avalanche. Um, he is like directed that he's going to be going to the uh, Earth Defense Alliance uh, base on the moon. Uh, the the guys are going to be attacking in like five hours. But I thought it was funny that they they still had were like bothering to go through the formality of issuing him uniforms and such. Yeah. Like yeah. he g- gives him a uniform and he says, I thought I actually looked pretty sharp, like an intrepid young space hero about to embark on an epic adventure. Then I realized that was more or less my new job description. Oh, my God. Which, Which of course, a, I was. Which, exactly. <laughs> it's his Kleinian turn of phrase. Um, but he's uh, he's getting ready to go uh, hop on the uh, sh- shuttle to the moon. But he has a, fi- a final encounter with Lex. Um, yes. Can I describe Lex? Please. <laughs> I turned to see Lex standing at rigid attention in her new EDA uniform, which looked as if it had been tailored to accentuate her frame. <laughs> he oh, really, man. really is a perv, isn't he? Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just guessing, you know, Lara Croft is like what he's going for there. Yeah, and she finds out that she's going to Montana, correct? Uh-huh. And uh, and this is where she turns into Elaine from Seinfeld. I counted right. four or five playful shoves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I she's just really, shoving uh, him all those. over the place. Yeah, that's amazing. Giving him grief after he, you know, gets his ass chewed out by the chief. And uh, <laughs> uh, she, but he says this. I, I this is a question for for you or anyone. It reminded me of the DMV offices in Portland, although, thank Zod, the line here appeared to be moving much more quickly. I just don't get that. Thank Zod? Is he, he's just avoiding using God and... Yeah, I thought there was another one, like, when he was in the battle where he said, like, heavens to something else where he was doing that. I mean... So it's just him picking other things and... I mean, Zod is the... uh, It's Superman, Superman, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a... uh, it just must be a a some, something he's doing for a humorous effect. <laughs> ah, okay. So once again, <laughs> he impossible he to said tell. very unsteadily, as if you know, <laughs> indicating that he did not find it humorous. Yes. Yeah, that's that's all I could go. But I noticed those two, and I think they keep coming. Uh, he also says to Lex, "Listen," I said, as if she weren't quite obviously already doing so. Again, wasting our time in his. <laughs> I know we just met, but I just want to let you know that I wish we'd met each other a long time ago under different circumstances. And uh, I just thought, I don't know what, maybe during back-to-back viewings of Say Anything? Like, <laughs> I mean, he's not that old. Like, wish we'd met a long time ago? I, I, right. I guess so. I guess we'd, you know, if we'd played hopscotch together or whatever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it struck me as very clumsy. 
I wish we'd met a long time ago during the age where it was still suitable for young boys and girls to bathe together without any clothes on. That would have been. <laughs> uh, um, that's all I have for 13. Yeah, yeah. It ends on a sort of another thrilling contact exchanging scene. Um, she, she quotes the Big Lebowski, which is just sort of unfortunate. Um, but yeah, it moves into uh, he, uh, he's about to meet a whole bunch of new characters. And uh, this is the, the chapter where I really started to wear out the red pen. So I'm excited to discuss it. Yeah. Roll up your sleeves, everyone. Uh, if you're reading along, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> I wish we had there should almost be theme music for this entire segment. It's this is amazing. Yeah, it's uh oh man, I don't know what it would be. Too many cooks, the uh, theme song for that one, because he's uh he's about to lay it on thick. He he doesn't do characters well, and uh, when he's when he's introducing a whole bunch of them at once, it gets really unfortunate. Yeah, I but, thought uh, about. Um, I once heard um, Garrison Keeler, if I'm still allowed to use his name <laughs> in, in polite company, um, say that he really hated uh, scenes of, with many people in them. He couldn't write scenes. He hated getting people in and out of the room. And that, that struck a note with me like, yeah, that is difficult to do when you're writing to describe action. And and that's what Klein wades right in with no trepidation or fear whatsoever. (laughs) (laughs) This is a big pack of people and he's, uh, and he goes at it with gusto. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he's going to meet, uh, the rest of the people who sort of round out the top 10, uh, pilots and they are uh, Debbie, the uh, middle aged but still pretty mom, uh, Wody, the teenager from uh, New Orleans, and uh, Crazy G, who is his uh, the the uh, token Asian character from this book. Um, we had some in the last book as well. And then we have Milo, the Cushmaster, who's a uh, comic book guy from Philly. Yep. And they all uh, now he overhears them before he meets them. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's essentially doing the, uh, you know, peeking up from behind the bushes or uh, uh, behind the curtain type of thing, overhearing a whole lot of discussion. Yeah. And uh, uh, oh, man, I think I lost my note on that. Oh, there was something that made me laugh in that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the uh, what made I noticed, first of all, was he uses the term uh, uh, pregnant pause right away. Yeah. Which is, you know. Take it easy, Klein. But then uh, right after that, he stood there for an awkward beat. So he has two uh, um, ways to describe that exact same thing um, back to back. Um, one of them was <laughs> a lot weirder. And uh, that, that phrase always stands out to me. It's a <laughs> pregnant pause is a. Uh, but uh, he, so, yeah, he's uh, these people are, are all sort of uh, about to fly to the moon. Uh, they just survived a, a battle and all of them were, were at home two hours ago. Um, but they're all just sort of like, you know, cracking some jokes. Uh, they're sort of taking it easy. Um, I, I told you it was like, uh, <laughs> I looked up the opening of saving private Ryan and you know, the people are, are puking on these, on these boats coming them on to Omaha beach. Tom, Tom Hanks is like his, he can't open his canteen cause his fingers are shaking right. so much, <laughs> but we've got, uh, we've got Wody, the 16 uh, year old girl as, uh, just, uh, talking about how much ass she kicked just in the battle there. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a, a, a serious amount of nonchalance going on that is uh, completely unwarranted. Um, but hey, uh, good news. I found our uh, paragraph, and and uh, uh, you're going to help me out on this, if you would. Oh. Yeah, okay, so I found it. It's uh, when he's overhearing the things, he's, he's overhearing a guy talking to these two women, and in it, he says, and we'll read this part, but he uh, mm-hmm. he says that the the man is chuckling the whole time while this woman talks. And I just thought it'd be fun. How does that actually work in actuality? Right. So we're taking uh, it at face value, right? So uh, so let's uh, let's do that now. Here's the here's right. the actual piece. Hate to tell you, but the Red Baron was a dude too, just like Maverick, Goose, Iceman, and every other fighter pilot in history. And then Wody says, uh, you're aware that those are all fictional characters, right? The younger woman asks, talking over the man's chuckling. For your information, there have been female fighter pilots for over 100 years. I wrote a report about it for school. A woman named Marie Morant flew combat missions over France way back in World War I. And the Russians used female fighter pilots in World War II. And the U.S. military has had women fighter pilots since the 70s. <laughs> so yes at what point does she just begin right. leaping on top of him wrapping her legs around his neck and just tearing his hair out and punching him repeatedly 
Or just doing the uh, um, staring at Oliver Hardy sort of take as he's uh, <laughs> like yes. slow burn as he's in. Would you stop doing that? <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, it's just such a funny thing that he, I think, again, when he tries, he gets above his station and he puts in unforced errors like that. For, unfortunately, there was no pregnant pause in his in his <laughs> chuckling. Uh, right. But yeah, so the uh, the characters here, we're, we're about to meet some just, just rich Richly developed people that are in no way uh, straight out of uh, central casting or the same uh, uh, TV tropes page as the Angry Chief. Um, we've got Debbie. I forget her her mom. She had a handle called Mom or something. Yeah. Uh, later, that's joked upon. Atomic Mom. Oh, Atomic Mom. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so Wody is uh, sort of this, this street smart uh, teen, and uh, she right away is, is just swearing and stuff, but... Uh, he sees Debbie wince uh, when when Wody dropped her f bomb, uh, which right. um, again you know, we're we're going off to war, but this is still something that offends her delicate uh, religious uh, sensibilities. Um, How does he feel about and, religion? I, he hasn't made that clear. <laughs> oh, it's going to be this is yeah the, that 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 is going to be great um, because that is the part that I just like wrote about and read the most. But um, let's, let's, let's introduce the rest of the people. Um, oh, wait, I, I, I did find atomic mom's introduction. She okay. says, uh, atomic mom at your service. She smiled nervously, you know, like atomic bomb. <laughs> and from this line, I, I would guess that he was picturing Mr. Rooney's secretary from Ferris Bueller's day. Off, oh, wow. You know, like, you know, like atomic bomb, just Definitely, yeah. dumb as opposed and sort of sweet and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, or empty righteous. headed. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I had written down that. I thought it was like, uh, Mary Bailey's alternate, uh, universe take. And it's a wonderful life where just the mere lack of existence of George has turned her into this, uh, bookish, uh, librarian. She's who's this just old... about to close up the library. <laughs> yeah, she's this horrible old maid who's <laughs> yeah. afraid of men and, uh, <laughs> yes. So that was a, that was the, maybe a combination of the two, but uh, yep, because you. <laughs> um, but then, uh, yeah. So then, uh, Crazy G. I mean, there's I don't know what else to say about him other than he's the token Asian guy, and he had spiky red hair that obscured the right half of his face, but the look seemed to work for him. <laughs> Again, what, what's the butt mean? But the look seemed, and also seemed to work. For, you tell us. You're the narrator. Right. You're right. describing his look. Right. Since he's describing essentially like any given, um, you know, sort of Asian guy from a Final Fantasy book right. or Final Fantasy game, like, of course it works for him because you're describing a well-trod uh, character stereotype. Um, it would be weird if that didn't work for him since that's how the stereotype is defined. <laughs> right. Um, and then there's uh, Milo, who I was delighted with. Um, so, again, he's, uh, you know, a, a comic book guy a weed smoking comic book guy who had some sort of East coast accent that sounded equally thick to my Pacific Northwestern ears. Um, and then he's, he's reckon, he's introduced as being like, Oh, he's, he's a dick, but that's okay. He's from Philly. <laughs> so the Philly accent is a thing. And I don't know how widespread of a thing it is. I know it because my dad, uh, and his family, um, are from Philly. Yeah. I know that the, uh, the Sklar brothers love to do huh. a Philly accent. I think, they, oh, okay. they, I think they have a bit about it in their act. Um, nice. Yeah. It's it's hard to describe and it's cuz it's not it's not one that your average um hack comedian has in his repertoire, you know. It's not Boston, it's not New York, it's not uh southern, it's not, you know, SoCal. So it and I I the the key that, you know, I I asked my family about it and everyone was sort of like, "Oh, well, well dad says wood are funny." Yeah, that's it. That's that's it, where it all that's the Sklar brothers take on it too is talking about water ice. Yeah. There's more to it than that, but it is. It's got that weird maybe vowel pronunciation. I don't know how to describe it, but it does exist. But uh my, I asked my dad about it and he said something that I'm not sure if this is true, but he claimed it's the basic root American tongue from early colonial William Penn times. All other accents are regional spinoffs. So oh, that wow. is his yes, it's a bold <laughs> claim. He's a Philadelphia chauvinist, isn't he? Yes, exactly. Um, so maybe that's true. Maybe, um, you know, I guess Ben Franklin probably spoke that way and we all took it from there. But um, so, yeah, but later on, he's uh, Milo is described as <laughs> his Rocky Balboa-esque method of speaking somehow made his cocky enthusiasm seem endearing. So. Rocky Balboa is probably the most fictional, the most famous fictional Philadelphian. Right. And so that is, but Rocky Balboa <laughs> speaks like Sylvester Stallone. Yes, he does not. Who's not 
use this accent that we've just been unable to identify. But it is it is not, you know, Stallone sounds like a Stallone impression, which <laughs> right. is a funny. It's he, So he's he's unable to even he's just claiming that he sounds like the most famous fake citizen of Philadelphia. Right. And, and not a. He, he can't think of a real person. I mean, of course right. he can't think of a real person. What am I saying? Right. <laughs> but I thought that was, I thought that was funny. Um, now the, but... the, uh, crazy G, um, mm-hmm. he has a synthesized voice. He, he does cause he doesn't speak much English. So he translates, but this made me laugh. He, uh, I was thinking the same thing. The computer said in a synthesized male voice that sounded exactly like the one used by Stephen Hawking. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, why does it have to sound exactly like it? We get what synthesized voices sound like, you know? Right. Uh, right. We, we all understand that. But that causes him to go on a little reverie where he says, I suddenly found myself mm. wondering if Hawking had been a part of the EDA's big cover-up too. Or what about Neil deGrasse Tyson? I just wrote, why stop there? What about <laughs> Flo from the Progressive ads or legendary guitarist Ingve Malmsteen? I mean, <laughs> What do you mean? Right. Why, and why would they have any more access to it than anybody else? I mean, it's a big, it's a huge conspiracy, but it could be wide or it could be small. I mean, he doesn't know anything about it. Right. And this one just stood out because of the, we, I, I think I tricked you with a fanfic ep- excerpt last week that involved both of these people. So the fact that they do both show up makes this like yeah, the know. world's <laughs> shittiest foreshadowing. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Like he, he wonders that. And then it's like a, a sitcom character being like, uh, oh no, like, or, uh, back to school with Rodney Dangerfield. Like if only I had Kurt Vonnegut here to help me out with this assignment, you know, knock, <laughs> right. knock, knock, like, whoa, Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like my car just broke down guys. I was wondering if, uh, you needed help with your, <laughs> with yeah. your football team. Like I hear you're short a quarterback, <sighs> but, uh, so yeah, the uh, he's he's sort of introducing himself to these people. Uh, I forget what provokes this, but a, a scene that stood out to me was uh, I slowly mimed cranking up the middle finger on my right hand. Yes. <laughs> when it reached full mast, they both finally seemed to get the hint and looked away. So I imagined him, you know, slowly miming this this familiar gesture, but all the characters sitting there being like, "Where's he going with this? What's he doing? What's oh, got it, got it, <laughs> yes. right, a middle finger." <laughs> Uh, before that, I think what, uh, that one made me laugh, but the, uh, the Wody's gag, I thought, man, Wody is the best because, uh, Wody laughed and mimicked the translator's voice while she made stiff robotic motions with her arms. Yes. She intoned the Baron is complete face fuck. <laughs> so this is, uh, again, uh, this is that saving private Ryan uh, Higgins boats uh, coming, pulling up to the uh, Omaha beach and uh, right. she's doing like a, a second grader doing a robot and then says <laughs> face fuck. Right. Oh, it's just not very good. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so as we talked earlier, the emotions do careen wildly. So everyone's having a good laugh at uh, Wody's uh, robot, um, but also potentially racist impression. And then, uh, uh, but he does, as they take off, uh, he notices that uh, Debbie had her head down and her hands were clasped together in her lap. Mm-hmm. Her, eye, her eyes were closed and she was moving her lips in silence. What are you doing? Milo asked, sounding genuinely curious. <laughs> so in a book full of colossal dumbasses, we have a guy who's observing a woman praying and <laughs> what are you doing he, he's never seen this act he's never been you know even uh even aware of it uh that this is something that people do and uh I, that, that this is where a, a a tremendous stretch of book begins to happen he's uh when he goes on european tours and like he steps into old cathedrals and stuff he's really annoying there yeah <laughs> what are you doing Please, sir, <laughs> sir, this is the right. 10 o'clock mass. <laughs> right. um, and then uh, so he's uh, – my Milo is another sort of stand-in for a, uh, a Klein type of guy. She says she's praying and then um, he's like, oh, well, yeah, of course, Milo said, chuckling. Um, that's, that's sort of his thing, I guess. But uh, <laughs> just one question, church lady. <laughs> In what part of the Bible <laughs> – did Jesus warn about this alien invasion? And then he sort of does the, he glances around the cabin for the rest of the support. Do you know, am I right guys? Cause I must've missed that verse. And then, uh, so he's he, that, that's funny. But then Debbie stares back at him instantly livid. She opened her mouth 
but the question seemed to have her so flustered that she didn't know how to respond. <laughs> so this is uh, Debbie is her 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 lifelong faith has been immediately shaken by yeah by I wanted, uh, I idiotic, wanted to suggest uh, a an apologetics class for her like you need. <laughs> You need a little bit of training about how to handle challenges to your faith. You're a <laughs> rocked to your very core by that. Right, exactly. It is a, uh, it's, it seemed unlikely that that would be how she would respond to it. Instead of, you know, she should have maybe uh, slowly cranked up a middle finger uh, to the point where, where Milo would, would recognize it. <laughs> Finally. But then our, our this, this continues. Our narrator uh, says, I'd been raised to believe there was no real difference between religion and mythology which is slightly different than his uh, devout agnostic line a little bit earlier. But then he's, uh, he's, he's sort of willing to hear out what people have to say here. Um, but then Wody, the 16 year old, uh, begins to recite revelation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which someone pointed out in the email is that he, so there's the, the book of revelation. Yeah. He keeps calling it revelations, which is just, you know, I guess that's an, a nitpick, but she, Wody has all this memorized because, um, not only do our heroes memorize every movie in existence, our hero has memorized NASA, uh, but she's memorized uh, Bible and Shakespeare. But after she re- recites Revelations, <laughs> Debbie, who was uh, instantly livid and so flustered a paragraph ago, uh, begins to applaud. And then Chen and I joined in, <laughs> which is just those, one of those moments of she did and then you did. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, But yeah, um not Debbie, uh, Wody had seen all this, those Branagh and Zeffirelli movies about a zillion times each. Yep. So I know every word by heart that it's just, he projects onto everyone his desire to see things a zillion times. <laughs> um, but people made fun of her for this. So, and right. sort of a, uh, kind of a heartfelt thing about being bullied as a child, which ends with, but then I punched their fucking lights out and they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so Wody is also a hair trigger psychopath like Zach. <laughs> I guess so. And then she tags it with uh about her parents, but they both died in a hurricane when I was little. <laughs> right. Yeah, oh, wait. So yeah, but before that, De- Debbie looks hor- horrified and says such language your parents didn't let you swear around them, do did they? Or do you do they? And yeah, she says no, they they didn't used to, but then they both died in a hurricane when I was little, so now I get to say whatever the fuck I want. Um, so Debbie, Debbie's back to being horrified after applauding. Uh, but then, oh, snap, Milo muttered under his breath. Debbie says, you poor dear, looking embarrassed. I'm sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, of course. That's five minutes ago. <laughs> well, she says, they drowned, she said. I saw their bodies. And so Milo, who uh, has just, oh, snapped uh, uh, sentences ago, she didn't elaborate. Milo was too taken aback to even respond. <laughs> Which is a uh, so he knew he knew that they died, but he's just taken aback by seeing their bodies. I guess you know he, he's never heard of religion, so he's unaware of the idea that like you might see dead people. There's like open casket funerals. That's you know she might have been caused to called to look at their bodies. She might have been in the room where they were drowned in their house. So yeah, but the more we learn about Milo, the more it becomes clear that something is. I mean, something's not right with this guy and his emotions <laughs> swinging all over the place because then he goes on a big speech about how this opportunity is like the greatest thing in the world. He has some sort of, you know, Henry V rallying cry. Uh, And then he he gets upbraided by uh, Debbie. And because, you know, we're all going to, are you kidding? We're going to die. We're outnumbered and everything. And uh, so after his his, uh, Henry V speech, uh, he says, what? I may have missed that part of the briefing. <laughs> then under her withering glare, he added, I have ADD. My mind wanders during long meetings. <laughs> so he missed the part that they were being invaded. Like what, where did he think he was going? What yeah. he missed what, that? He just zoned out during that part. <laughs> right. It's probably not how that uh, condition works. Um, but also he just did, uh, you know, engage in this fight that, uh, they all were part of. Right. Um, and yeah, he says the, are the odds really never that bad? Are the odds really that bad? The Admiral never said, but then, you know, fortunately three paragraphs after his, uh, he's given the speech that he's been genuinely surprised and then he's has genuine fear. But then three paragraphs later, he's waving dismissive hands and saying, ah, oh, grow some balls. If k- killing this alien dipshit is half as easy as it is in the game, we're going to kick their European asses. Ah, so yes. it's, uh, 
the sign curve has turned back up again towards uh, dismissive uh, confidence. And I just realized as we read this, so it's pretty much, are they implying that uh, Wody's parents probably died in Hurricane Katrina? I think so, yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm hoping we get some uh, some 9-11 orphans later, because that would really be a... Uh, that would really be a nice trivialization of a, of a serious condition. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, here is a moment. So they, they do the, um, what's his name? Uh, G, Jai, J, what? Yeah. Uh, Crazy G. Crazy G. Jai, what are you, who cares? He creates their rallying cry, which I'm sure yes. you have it written down there. I don't have Shang it. Shang Li? Yes. Yeah. He leaps to his feet, as I, <laughs> as I recall, <laughs> and shouts it out. And instead of being, you know genuinely afraid or puzzled or whatever they just join in with him uh immediately and then they put their hands together so he doesn't describe the action of them all getting together and doing that but you know they stack their hands like a team and he said uh then the uh, uh the intercom said you know we're approaching and he said this seemed to make us self-conscious and we all quickly <laughs> withdrew our hands yes i noted that it, too. <laughs> it seemed to well, could you ask the writer, could we get a definitive read on whether they were self-conscious? Right. We're relying on you. You're Again. the guy. And even if he admitted the seemed, it would be another just like crazy whiplash of like, oh, why? Like, you know, it's not, uh, I, I don't understand why, you, what, what, what has changed in this, in this three second interval from you all being excited. And then why this guy just announcing that you're arriving at your destination has made you self-conscious. I think, uh, it's probably, he's was looking for a different word, made our, <laughs> our, our confidence shook Impending our confidence death. or yeah. yeah, but not self-conscious. <laughs> yeah. That's not, that's not what he was going for there. All right. Well, we, there's a lot more to talk about here, but let's just, I noticed that there was just a, a stretch of incredibly shitty, um, descriptions here so i'm just going to read them um this is what happens when he for all for all as bad as it was that line about godzilla we knew what he was getting at right yeah absolutely it was a thing bursting through these things and like you know he could have been picking up a, a elevated train you know we, we we know that image yeah but so he starts off with uh with a getting heavy as they are approaching the base as we sailed over the cratered and barren lunar surface i was struck by a brief vision of earth after the coming conflict the battle had left our world ravaged and dead, as devoid of life and color as its own moon. Its oceans and atmosphere burned away, its mighty cities replaced with impact craters, and the whole of its once beautiful surface scorched black by the fire of war. So that's 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 bad. Um, and it's just so when he's lacking these uh, touchstones of popular culture, he he has to uh, um, sort of try to describe things on his own. So he's describing the base, and this is just. Uh, it, see, see if you understood what he was getting at. The lips of all three craters touched, and when viewed from directly above, their outlines somewhat resembled the shape of a pocket watch, with Daedalus B standing in for the small round knob on pot top, and Daedalus C serving as the even smaller chain ring attached to it. So, yeah, yeah, I was puzzled by that too. It looks like a pocket watch. These yes. three contiguous craters. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand that at all. It's sort of like a, a, a slightly disproportionate snowman, you know. I mean, a pocket watch is not a, you know, this this boy who was born in 1999 is probably not seeing too many of those in his time. But an even less common touchstone is what he goes on to do, to describe it. And this is amazing. Uh, he says its design was similar to that of the Arecibo Observatory in the mountains of Puerto Rico, which. Um, yeah. <laughs> Come on, sure. you can pull that out immediately, can't you? <laughs> You're right. Yes. You know, that's uh, right out there with Mount Rushmore and the Epcot Center Ball. But uh, then he goes on to to describe it as uh, the two small craters each had an armored sphere nestled inside, like a golf ball sitting atop a shot glass. Yeah, and, I didn't uh, I didn't understand that. This the it's so it's a it's a dish and then a golf ball on top of a shot glass? <laughs> I mean, that is what he described it as, why that is something that we should recognize or understand how it applies to a giant moon base. I am baffled, but I did appreciate the, uh, the look inside what he, what he tries to do as he, um, as he uses his own words to describe things. Well, he, Fortunately, it doesn't last long. He, he gets us back to a touchstone right away. Now I found <laughs> myself wondering if the EDA had borrowed elements from Stanley Kubrick's design. After all, stranger things had obviously happened, and we're still happening right now. So uh, bringing in that conspiracy, which, uh, as we'll see in huh. the next chapter, yeah. turns out to be uh, obviously a real I thing. 
splice together the uh, the moon landing conspiracy, but that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, again, I would I would read a book about that theory uh, and be so much more entertained than I would be by by this stuff. Um, but it ends. Uh, I think they, they're arriving. He's nervous about meeting his father. But the last uh, sentence that stood out for me um, was a really good uh, description. And it was such a good description that it, it conjured up like sounds in my head. Um, and it's they're all unbuckling their things. But he says, Wody immediately unbuckled her harness and literally jumped out of her seat. <laughs> yes. She was ar- she was already running when her feet hit the floor. And so I pulled a uh, sound clip of, of Wody already running when her feet hit the floor. <laughs> yes, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that is how how she's doing that. And then uh, there's a puff of steam and she takes off with the uh, the uh, whoosh emoji. She uh, also she comes back floating in air and just goes, I hate you. And then she resumes her uh, Yosemite <laughs> Sam style to Bugs Bunny. Right. Um, yeah, but, uh, he's, uh, they've landed on the moon and they're about to, uh, sort of meet his father. And I guess that's what we're, what we're taking away from this next, uh, chapter. Yes, indeed. This is the tender meeting. This is the, uh, contact moment. Kind of remember that movie. She flies through space to, to meet her dead dad. Who's a ghost huh. of space no, ghost. And yeah. I don't remember, but I guess similar to, uh, there's moments that reminded me of interstellar coming up as well with the, the letters and all that stuff. But, right, uh, right. he starts off like he's, he's keeping his distance from all the other people, um, that he's flown up there with. But he says, uh, this is, this is, this is funny because he describes it as out of the corner of my eye. So keep that in mind out of the corner of his eye. Mm-hmm. I saw Meadows aphid escort Debbie through a pair of armored doors at the opposite end of the hangar. Chen, Milo and Wody were waiting for them just inside the tunnel on the other side, along with an ETA officer I didn't recognize who had a Japanese flag on his uniform. The entire group gaped at us through the airlock doors until the doors slammed shut again a second later with a dull boom that echoed through the vast hangar. So out of the corner of his eye, he's picking up like tiny little uh, flag emblems on uniforms. He's picking up gaping. It's a very, very good corner of his eye vision. Very astute. Well, it's funny you should mention that because later... He's talking to his father. I'm just going to, this doesn't spoil anything. It's just a, uh, it has to do with vision. Uh, then together we continued to cross the hangar and I finally widened my focus enough to take in the details of my surreal <laughs> surroundings. Wow. Wow. So should... this is very strange vision. The corner of his eye is the one he uses for extreme detail and then widening <laughs> his vision. Then he can see buildings and stuff like that. So it's some yeah. sort of weird superpower we have yet to understand. Right. I guess it's probably the idea of playing a video game and like just uh, you know, that that might be something you do there, but it's not a way that a human has ever <laughs> right. and interacted with the world without some sort of like blinding device on them. Uh, another vision thing, though, is he uh, he finds himself staring uh, at, at his father <laughs> at a drop of sweat that had formed on his brow and then watched it as it rolled down the side of his face as if this detail were proof this was really happening. It made me think of a scene in the original Total Recall, another movie I knew by heart because he'd once owned a a copy on VHS. So that's jam-packed of like four Klein cliches. He finds himself doing something. Uh, He mentions uh, uh, a movie and goes out of his way to identify it as the original and not the forgotten 2012 remake. And then, of course, he's memorized the movie. Right. Why doesn't he just stop it? It made me think of a scene in... Also, he didn't add that it immediately made him think of a scene. So this could have happened right. later. I, I just, That's I'm true. confused. That would have been, I'm, other, I'm that out would of have been time. a But uh, he's, uh, I, I don't know what scene he's talking about. I've never seen that movie, but it probably doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, so he's, he's, he's met his father. He, he yeah, who, drinks in the details of his long lost father's face. My firsthand familiarity with his features made it easy for me to detect the fear he was trying to conceal. Wow. He, uh, yeah. that's another part of his supervision, uh, <laughs> his ability to read emotions. Um, now his father, this was, uh, brings us back to his insanely hot mom. Oh his, yeah. His oh my God. Father looks 10 <laughs> years older than his 37 years. Unlike his mother uh-huh. who looks a decade younger than her yes. 37 years. Yes. Mom so looks like she's 27. Insanely hot mom <laughs> is 27 years old. So if we're going to take that at its word, that means that it looks like she gave birth to him at the age of nine. <laughs> yep. So when people see them out together, I mean, they, you know, that's totally not uncommon. I mean, she, the people could possibly think that they were an item as they were like dropping him off at, uh, at work or, you know, the school play or whatever. It, uh, it's like, uh, when 
Bill and Ted, his his dad started dating like one of his former like high school uh, classmates. <laughs> right. Who he had asked to the prom. Yeah. So his dad, um, uh, you know, does the a quick apology. This supposed to be the heartfelt thing. I left you, but I had to and all of this. And uh, I've been. I've been tracking you this whole time and it was the most painful thing in the world. And I know you're a ball of rage (laughs) and he explodes at this. Yeah. And then my father laughed involuntarily at the irony of my response, but it was lost on me. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) You're you're the voice we're reading. If it's lost on you, then how the hell do you know? And we know that he was laughing involuntarily at it. Right. Once the, again, it's the out of body. Like, who's describing this? It's the right. first person. I guess he's many. He need to say the humor of it was lost on me. I don't know. He's saying because he's enraged, it was lost on me. The irony. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but he he uh, he he demands. How could you possibly know if I've got a temper? <laughs> I mean, you know, the exasperation is, has reached a point where it's hard to be exasperated. But they had a spy watching him for for a third of his life. Right. We interacted with on a daily basis. So, like, come on, man. Yes. Uh, uh, his father uh, presents him with a a flash drive collecting um, mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of letters that he had written to him. Uh, I wrote to, to you and your mom every single day I was up here. So <laughs> he had better get started. <laughs> yeah. 17 times 365. Yeah. Wow. I hope they were very brief. Like, well, it looks like I'm running out of room. I mean, if there's any more detail than than that, he's... he's Yeah. I mean, by the end of a week at Boy Scout camp, my things home were like, (laughs) found a crayfish. Um, (laughs) Guess I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, (laughs) Right. And uh, yeah, so, but he's he's into it. And uh, you can tell he's into it. Uh, Oh, wait, wait. First of all. When he sees his dad, uh, he says that a dam ruptured somewhere in my chest and a torrent of feelings came rushing out of me all at once. Like an avalanche or Godzilla. (laughs) And then two paragraphs later, each word he spoke made my heart swell until it felt as if it might burst. Well, thankfully, it doesn't burst like that dam. (laughs) Two paragraphs earlier had burst. That would not be good. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, when he gives him the flash drive with all the emails... I, I slipped the flash drive into one of my uniform's breast pockets so that it rested directly over my heart. Like, let's yeah. all let's all settle down. Let's just yeah. like take a take a walk around the block. You know, get a drink of water because this is <laughs> we're getting a little uh, you know romance novelly in that uh, in that aspect. Yeah, I noted. I I wanted to write that down, but I think but, you know again the nitpicks at this point is is too much. But uh, it, it was resting over your heart because you know that is where the pocket is, and you know it's, <laughs> right. it's kind of where you had to put it. But uh, I'll let it pass. I understand right. what you're saying again, Godzilla. And it again just occurred to me. There's no chance, right? There is no chance that at some point in time he's going to take a, a projectile. <laughs> Uh, that will then be stopped by this uh, device in the one of the oldest cliches of a Bible or a flask um, stopping a bullet. No, there's zero percent chance there's, of that. Okay, Come on. I'm just putting it out there. There can't possibly be. Um, there so, can't possibly be. I'm just <laughs> no. I'm trying to talk myself into that being true. Uh, so they walk to the hangar the dad they have their little they have their heartfelt moment i don't have much on that it's all pretty no, it's cookie all cutter just, cliche yeah. but here's a here's a paragraph a short paragraph but nevertheless th- this one just uh, maybe at some point you could interrupt me with a would you just please because here, <laughs> here it goes in that moment i felt like luke skywalker surveying a hangar full of a y and x-wing fighters just before the battle of yaven or Captain Apollo climbing onto the cockpit of his Viper on Galactica's flight deck. Ender Wigan arriving at battle school. Would or you just- Alex Rogan. <laughs> I'm just about done clutching his Star League uniform, staring wide-eyed at a hangar full of gun stars. Yep. Uh, but I wasn't Buck Rogers or Flash <laughs> Gordon or Ender Wigan or anyone else. Would you stop <laughs> just listing things you feel like? Just settle it's- on one. Again, you can do that. Just settle. And that was one that we, uh, you know, I pulled out in the first episode, I think, to challenge you about fan fiction. And I don't think you believed it was real. But <laughs> again, as we've seen, all these things have again been referenced since then. In the case of, you know, Luke Skywalker, many times um, Alex Rogan is the uh, story this is all based from. So it's not like 
he didn't like, hold back and then uh, dump these all at once. They've been doled out repeatedly, and now they're just a f- dump as he uh, goes full Klein for an entire paragraph. <laughs> right. Yeah, he. Uh, th- this was funny. He says, uh, he turned back to me, and I think that was when I caught my first glimpse of something truly unsettling in my father's eyes. A hint of the very madness that I'd always feared I might have inherited from him. Wow. And that was, I thought that was funny because the madness that he thought, thought he inherited was just based on these crazy notes he had found. Right. And all those crazy notes were, were have been had been proven to be true. So there's no right. I mean, there's no madness anymore. Like the <laughs> yeah, madness has been fully disproven. Like his father was right about everything. His father is uh, not only completely sane, he's brilliant. And he's also apparently a great leader and a. But a button down military man. Right. Who, who emotion- did write every day and stayed faithful. And- yeah. Huge, uh, hugely disciplined, obviously, um, to be able to do this. So <laughs> he's uh, you're in good. Uh, you're 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 fine, kid. But yeah, so we are approaching at this point something that I we again, we have talked for a long time today. We have talked about these books for a long time, uh, but we've we're approaching something that I think is probably the strongest reaction I've had to something that he has, has written. <laughs> this would um, be uh, the leading up to it is a, the, you're talking about the sitcom moment where he's like, what's in there? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it's not that part. No, no, no. That's, that's great. But this is a, uh, this is just a, either a, a, a su- suppressed something coming to the forefront or just complete and total lack of awareness in how he writes. Because, uh, so as we've talked about war is imminent, Mm-hmm. Everyone assumes that this is going to be an unsuccessful operation uh, because they're outnumbered, they're outgunned, and even if they win this battle, there's three times as many things coming. So, you know, again, uh, spirits are, are are low. But uh, he is noticing, uh, as you said, that uh, a, a lot of these design elements look kind of familiar. Yeah. And uh, when I mentioned to my father that it looked like certain elements of the base's exterior design had been borrowed from the fictional Clavius base seen in the film – 2001 a space odyssey he was delighted to confirm that they had <laughs> so so they're just having a good uh, you know father son moment chat as he's remarking about design elements from uh from uh six decade old uh stanley kubrick movies yes. and uh he uh then uh says he realizes that the eda stole a lot of ideas from sid mead and ralph mcquarrie like everyone else other people too once he told me all of that I suddenly began to see evidence of sci-fi design theft everywhere I looked inside the base. (laughs) (laughs) A2 Klein, the uh, (laughs) evidence of sci-fi theft everywhere I looked. Uh, And then in case, you know, in case you were worried that he might uh, sort of like take a step back and be like, wow, I really have uh, been just cribbing from everything. He goes on to quote, the cake is a lie from Portal in the very next sentence. (laughs) Yes, I noted that too. I posted that on a, a excerpt of my book uh, with I written that note in and, and people passed that around and were sort of just like gripping their desk. You know, you've got to be kidding me as they were reading it. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so then it gets to the moment that made me laugh really hard is uh, <laughs> this is the, the a, a chapter end. So something something big is going to happen. A reveal. We know how he does these chapter ends. And uh, it's that his his father won't let him see some room where he's just, for some reason, he just says, what's in there? You know, let me see in there. Like, no, 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 you wouldn't want to see that. There's nothing interesting in there. <laughs> it's like stepping in front of him and doing the sitcom back and forth, you know, right. and then gets around him and looks inside. And there is his father's, uh, I guess it's his bunk space, right? Mm-hmm. And he's got uh, pictures of Zach all over the walls. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh and then this one um a photo of my mother in her nurse's uniform which he must have found <laughs> on her hospital's website was hanging over his bed <laughs> and i just wonder <laughs> obviously the other guys at the base are sneaking in and photocopying that right, thing yeah. <laughs> and it's in everybody's room <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the insanely hot 27 year old in a nurse's in a uniform, nurse's uniform. <laughs> yeah Come on, man! You got to share. Like <laughs> they're hayseeds uh, passing around the one uh, tattered playboy on the uh, right. on the uh, sitcom army base. Yeah, the guy from New York is actually doing. Oh, she's a hot tomato, <laughs> right? Uh, it's killer and Beetle Bailey. His ears wiggle every time Miss Buckley <laughs> Miss Buxley walks by. <laughs> Oh, uh, man. So that yep. uh, that brings me to the end. I don't know if you have That's, any more on that. Yeah, I thought that it was funny that. Uh, that his uh, standoff, that sitcom-esque standoff you said, continued for a dozen or so seconds. <laughs> uh, 
which is funny. But then uh, four sentences later, his dad uh, ends the chapter. Hurry, he said, trying to hide the sudden unsteadiness in his voice. Every second counts. It's like, well, why did you just <laughs> you know, stammer like Chandler from Friends for uh, 12 <laughs> seconds to try to prevent him from seeing the touching moment in your room? Like, oh, uh, man. Well, that uh, does that bring us to the dumb sentence of the week? It does. Let's do it. A sentence begins with a capital letter. A capital letter is a letter that's big. A capital letter is not a small letter. A capital letter is big, big, big. A sentence ends with a period. Everybody, sing along. Yes, it's time for the dumb sentence of the week. And I will confess up front, I sort of accidentally read my dumb sentence of the week. Oh, no. But yeah. But I'm, sure. I'm no, sorry. Too, too, it was too good the, to ignore. It was the boom, boom, boom. One. Okay. Boom, <laughs> kaboom, is... boom. But I do have oh, a, a boring sentence of the week when that time comes. So okay. I didn't completely right. fail in my mission. All right. We've got some uh, good nominees from people. Uh, Trevor and Elizabeth sent in the same one. She turned as if to walk away. Then she abruptly turned again, spinning back around on her heels, grabbing me by my lapels, and then she kissed me right on the lips with tongue and everything. <laughs> I so forgot that's, about that. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, the uh, tongue and everything. Like, <laughs> But, you know, her uniform was accentuating the hell out of her form during that uh, tongue kiss. <laughs> yes. She looked almost as good as my 27-year-old insanely hot mom. <laughs> Uh, Janelle says, uh, the location of this base is, this is the angry chief. I think the location of this base is obviously no longer a secret to the enemy. If it ever was to begin with. And, uh, I think she pointed out that like, considering that they just waged war at the base, um, it wasn't a secret. It wasn't to begin with. They, uh, okay. Um, uh, Jordan sent this one in. This one's good. This is sort of two sentences, but they are, um, back to back. So it, it works as one. They're flying into space. I stared down at the radiant blue-white sphere that was home. Five sentences later. And there it was, the moon. A radiant gray-white bulb shining in the <laughs> darkness far ahead of us. And I, I don't know if it was him or someone else who wrote in, but they're like, neither of those things is is emitting light. Like, <laughs> right. <they're, laughs> the, sun, the sun is emitting light, and that's what radiant means. But um, right. to use the word twice in the span of the thing to describe the two different objects is quite a feat. But uh, here's my... Uh, he saw sense. himself noticing that they were radiant. How, how about that? There's the fix for that. <laughs> I suddenly realized that I was thinking that they were radiant. The, uh, the, the, my runner-up uh, was the detonation could cause the entire underground base to collapse in on itself, killing me and Lex and everyone else inside before any of us got our big chance to save the world. <laughs> so that's what he's worried about is that they wouldn't get a chance to save the world and not the dying, um, <laughs> which is idiotic. Uh, but then the one that I, I liked the best was he's talking about his dad. He looked older than I'd expected, but that was probably because he'd never been older than 19 in every photo I'd, of him I'd ever seen. That probably is. Um, <laughs> probably... The fact that you'd never seen him any older might mean that he would look older than you <laughs> had a picture of in your mind's eye. You and... colossal dumbass. <laughs> well, and he, he just forgot about aging. He... Right. Since his mom never ages, that must be the... Uh... Oh, he did yeah, toss in the, of course, a reference to carbonite in there, too, by the way. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. I'd always thought maybe my dad was, you know, encased in carbonite or something. <laughs> uh, uh, so we've got the boring sentence of the week. We had a good nominee from that from Janelle. Uh, this is before the pocket watch description, but it's laying out the, uh, the moon bases. The large crater, Daedalus, had a much smaller, steeper crater named Daedalus B immediately adjacent to it. And a third, even smaller crater adjacent to that known as Daedalus C. Yes. Nice and, nice and methodical to lay that out for us. That, when I read it, reminded me of, uh, I think it is in, uh, what, what's the storm movie from the 90s? Um, the tornado. Oh, Twister. Movie. Twister. Twister. The, uh, the uninitiated woman who's traveling with the Twister chasers uh -huh. says, you know, like, what's a, what's a class one? You know, and they all go, well, that's when there's light. What's a class two? And they go, oh, that's when the winds are heavy. What's a class three? And then finally she goes, what about an F4? And people <laughs> drop their spoons and <laughs> stare at her. <laughs> like, Come on, you you had to know I was going there. Yeah, don't think. You can't talk about F4s. Um, um, all right, well, what's your nominee? All right, boring sentence of the week. Uh, take a sip of coffee little Red Bull, and try to get through this. 
With the autopilot engaged, I changed my <laughs> controller configuration so that my throttle and flight stick now functioned as a dual joystick multi-axis firing controls for the Interceptor's omnidirectional laser turret. I picked as, the exact same one. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> as I did so, the turret's three-dimensional tar- targeting system activated, highlighting the enemy ships around me in an ever-widening spiral of overlapping red targeting brackets. <laughs> And I cut it off before the targeting practice, but yep, <laughs> that was what I picked. Nice. That's Fox, never happened. Uh, that's a first. No, that's amazing. That's unprecedented. But yeah, I just thought all the uh, all the jargon that you might get on a uh, controller box, uh, was, uh, multi-axis, omnidirectional <laughs> configuration. Yeah. Um, and again, it always, it always makes me want to bring it to a uh, storyboard artist and just sketch that out. Could you sketch this paragraph? He, out? he is flying into battle as he does that. There's, you know, the things are already blowing shit up and uh, buckling and warping the uh, blast doors and stuff. So he's that that's what he's he's choosing to do at this moment. Con- con- configuring his controller. I wonder what the what uh, Klein's controller rig how it it must have affected him in such a deep way and i i wonder what it is like i i'm not familiar with uh you know game uh you know actual gear for gaming so uh i would just love to know what is at his house and how he is must be so emotionally attached to it that it's i uh, bet uh he, his his uh father had a heart attack under a tree and then that tree was struck by <laughs> lightning and then he went out and like you know, whittled his own control rig from that uh, from that very same tree, and so it's his little wonder boy that he's carrying around. Yeah, it has to be that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, we had a uh, a really good uh, week for the uh, cow shirt. Three people bought one of the cow shirt hell of a rig shirts. Nice. You know, I yeah. forgot I was putting in my order last night because I don't you know. <laughs> I obviously don't have access to them, and I, I forgot to complete the order. And then I, I thought, is there any downside to me doing this? You know, <laughs> right? They're gonna the postman's gonna be like, well, I, uh, I got it. I had to put you on the list for this one. Um, exactly. But. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think that uh, if we uh, put this out on uh, on Friday, I think we're going to have our stretch goals up for our Kickstarter, our Rift Tracks Kickstarter 2018. And I think that fans of this podcast will be uh, eager to see what one of those Kickstarter uh, stretch goals is going to be. So go over there and check that out. Um, yeah, there might be a, a movie that could be relevant <laughs> to this podcast. Who knows? Right, so go over there and support that so we can make that happen because obviously that's going to be a lot of fun because it's uh, Klein-tober, baby. And uh, <laughs> that's... That's coming sooner than later. Um, I don't think there's anything else. The assignment for next uh, time is going to be uh, read up to chapter 19, which is page uh, uh, 250 in our version. Um, anything else to say? Well, I just wondered if you wanted to close it out again with your uh, the way that March comes out. Would you like to repeat that? Are you... You, you're pretty happy with that? Is this is, 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 <laughs> comes in like a lamb and goes out like a climber? <laughs> All right, and that's enough of that. Then we'll see you next time on 372 pages. We'll never get back. <laughs>